Hess bought this business for just $15,000 and scaled it into a multi-million dollar business. Hess Moen, owner of Midnight Mischief Sleepwear. My goal in physio was to own a clinic and become like a women's health physio. That's why I was on Gumtree and I was scrolling the business section and ad for Midnight Mischief popped up and it was like this picture of this beautiful girl like wearing personalized pajamas. It was a completely like new concept. It was quite novel still, like not a lot of people knew about personalized pajamas. And then a month later, I had a business. When COVID hit, there was an editor that reached out to the PR agency, can I feature Midnight Mischief? And honestly, like tripled our revenue. And we had like celebrities ordering our pajamas. Wow. Well, what's your view as a first immigrant Australian of this country and the opportunities here? I would have been like running barefoot on the streets of Vietnam, like on roofs, poorly educated. I just made a promise to myself being like, I'm, I'm going to make the most of my life here. What's up, guys, and welcome to this episode of Unemployable. This was an absolute ripper of a podcast. Uh, Tess Nguyen is in her 20s. She is a first-generation Australian. Her parents are immigrants from Vietnam who came here with nothing. Tess bought this business off Gumtree for just $15,000 and scaled it into a multi-million dollar business. And she was very gracious to share all of the details of how she did it from working with influencers, how much she pays them, which types of influencers work, which ones don't work. She talks about the keys to growing her business today that are not obvious until you pull on the threads a little bit, pardon the pun, and really get into the detail. And she talks about her approach and mindset to her business and the challenges she faced going from what was shaping up to be a career in physiotherapy. She did a hard right turn into entrepreneurship in her early 20s Everybody said she'd fail. She didn't fail. It's a great story. I think you'll love it. And right at the end, it got very, very real when we talked about her experience in Australia of being an entrepreneur um, from uh, Asian parents and what that journey was like. So stick around. It's a fabulous podcast. If you're out there wanting to start something, this podcast is packed with gems just for you. Enjoy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of Unemployable. Today, I am genuinely excited about this podcast because uh, our producer um, has sent us all the info about tests in advance. You guys had a chance to read it yet? The, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah it's good. This is one dynamic young lady. She's joining us from Sydney today. And I know you guys are going to love it. Um, you know, she's been written about on Channel 7. She's been written about on the Daily Mail. And um, she's a super nice young lady who's just crushing it in business. So uh, welcome to the show, Tess. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. We're so, so ex excited. We're so excited to have you. Uh, we're always excited to have entrepreneurs on, especially young entrepreneurs. But a young female entrepreneur is like the holy grail for us because we don't get too many of you. And I know that there's a big audience that wants to hear about the unique challenges of young women getting into business overcoming their fears and all that sort of good stuff and how, how you went about it. Before we dive into it, sort of check in with the boys. James, how are you, mate? You good? I'm very well, thanks. Looking forward to unpacking this. Um, as I said, the preamble that we've uh, had a read through is is interesting to say the least. So yeah, it's, be, it's a great story. So it'll, um, it'll be great for the listeners out there, for, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a great story, a great brand, and it just shows that you can, what you can do with, you know, fairly modest startup and just grit and determination. Eric, how are you, mate? Yeah, very good. Excited as always. Yeah. Um, after reading... Uh, the email with some of the information that came through and can't wait to uh yeah unpack it and let everyone else know th this story yeah yeah it's going to be awesome as always we want to thank our sponsor early bird ai that's e-a-r-l-i early bird ai these guys are a very fast growing artificial intelligence agency specifically designed to make putting artificial intelligence into your business simple and easy and not overwhelming and they are offering a free audit of the four key areas of your business, which is attracting more customers, converting more customers, delivering your product or service more efficiently, and then collecting your cash. They will do a free audit for you if you go to their website and they'll show you the tools that are available to you right now, a real person on a Zoom call with you going through your business and saying, hey, here's a bunch of ways we can help you save money, improve customer experience, and grow your business. So go over to earlybird.ai and get your audit book. They're based here on the Gold Coast. They're terrific young guys. And uh, they're just crushing it. So go and see them. So Tess, how are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you. I am well. <laughs> <laughs> so Tess, for those people who don't know, 
just give us a high level of what midnightmischief.com.au is so that we know what we're talking about. While you're talking, we'll get our team in post to put up a few shots of the website. We've had a look at it. I absolutely love what you sell. Um, so please tell us what what is Midnight Mischief? Sure. Midnight Mischief is a personalized luxury sleepwear brand. We specialize mainly in women's, men's, kids sleepwear. And we also branch off into bridal sleepwear as well. And so a lot of these collections I design myself uh, without a designer background. So it's been really, really fun to grow and learn about the fashion business in general. Wow. So you're the actual designer because I was going to ask that because I looked at it and I called Richard over off camera and said, man, look how beautiful this sleepwear is. My wife's actually overseas at the moment. When she gets back, I'm going to say, hun, have a look at this stuff. It's just so classy and beautiful. So tell us about how you got started because in the press, it says that you were scrolling Facebook marketplace from memory while you were trying to be a physio. So maybe before we go to how you discovered it, maybe tell us the path that you were on because we, we spoke before we rolled tape. You are of Vietnamese descent and uh, come from an Asian family. Um, and so a young woman that was on the path to be a physiotherapist and then started selling pajamas must have been a hard right turn for your parents. So talk to us about the reality of being Tess, this ambitious young woman who was on one path and, and what that was like and, and where you were in your life when you decided to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, sure. So at the time, I was a first year grad as a physio. And I loved physiotherapy. I really wanted to go hard in that career. I wanted to be an Olympic sports physiotherapist because I've always been in awe of athletes and like the elite athlete world, but I just knew I could never attain that <laughs> because I never played sport growing up. So I thought, okay, that's my way to get to the Olympics, like being a sports physiotherapist. And my goal in physio was to own a clinic and become like a woman's health physio. So I was definitely down that path. So that's why I was on Gumtree and I was scrolling the business section and I was looking at clinics to purchase. Well, not at that time, but I was more so doing my research of if I were to purchase a clinic, like how much it would cost. And okay, I'm in my first year now, like how much I, how much would I have to save in order to get to there? And so when I was scrolling through Gumtree, um, an ad for Midnight Mission popped up and it was like this picture of this beautiful girl, like wearing personalized pajamas. And this was back in 2018. So it was a completely like new concept. It was quite novel still, like not a lot of people knew about personalized pajamas. And I just thought like, wow, this is such a cool and unique concept. I think it's really interesting. And I just sent an inquiry in thinking not much of it. And then a month later, I had a business. <laughs> So, so what, what state, this is Gumtree you said, right? Yeah, it was on Gumtree. So what, what, where was the business at, at that point in time? Like what were they doing? Mm -hmm. So it was a one woman show. Um, the previous owner, she was like, yeah, incredible, like very creative, loves starting up things, but she also worked full time. So she was one of those people that loved to start up ideas, but not follow them through. Like she was more of a start up, like fulfill that idea, creative vision. Okay, I'm going to sell it off now. So um, yeah, it was still a small small run business, like a one woman show, essentially. And how were they selling the product? They were selling mainly online. So only through the e-commerce store and through organic socials. Yeah, was it big or so? I was gonna say, yeah, so when, when you acquired this, you essentially acquired a website. Um, and so uh, just a couple of questions on that. Just for the listeners out, listeners out there, when you talk about, and I'll get to the SKU um, section in a, in a minute, is personalized um, pajamas. So that would be a drop shipping model, right? So you wouldn't be holding stock if you had to personalize them. How do you um, run that part of that uh, model? Um, and then also when you did acquire it, how many SKUs were there? Like, was there like four or five? Because you, as you being a designer, you said you designed the range. What did it look like when you first acquired? Yeah, sure. So firstly, um, it definitely wasn't a dropship model. We held the stock and we outsourced all the embroidery um, to a local embroiderer. So it was very manual and it's still very manual to this day. Okay. Um, and then secondly, um, what was the second question again? Sorry. Oh, just when you acquired the site, uh, how many SKUs did it have? Because it was in your design background, you built out the, the range. What did it look like when you acquired it? Yeah, so there were about four pyjamas at the time and they were like long sleeve and short um short pajamas and like yeah four it was like one design but like four colorways so that's wow. how it worked so people would go to the website and was it that website midnight mischief at that time yeah, so midnight you go mischief. you go to the website and they're advertising these four different types of pajamas you could put in your name or your initials with the order you would then ship them out to get embroidered and then you ship them on to the customer is that basically how that worked 
Yes, that's correct. Oh, wow. 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 That's unique. How much, how much did you pay for it and how did you come up with that number? And I guess uh, explain uh, to us a little bit of the back and forth in the, the negotiation process because obviously you went from looking uh, at a physiotherapist clinic to then buying an online business and I'm assuming not knowing too much about buying a business and how to negotiate. So run us through that a little bit. Yeah, I definitely would do it differently now, knowing what I know in business. So yeah, definitely was very naive, didn't really know much about business in general. So previously, yeah, when I saw that listing, I think it was more around like that 40, 50K mark. And then I did purchase it for 15,000. And honestly, it was just more of like a negotiation being like, I can't afford $50,000. Can you drop this price? Can you drop this price even more and more? Um, so there wasn't any real thought behind it. It was just more like, I don't have the money for it. I have no idea how to price things. I did go to a commercial accountant, which was recommended by my physio boss, but he wasn't any help because all he said was like, you're going to fail. Um, like, don't do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then I asked other friends and peers, but we were so early in our careers, like no one really finished their degrees yet. So no one really knew um, what they were doing, but they practically said it's worth nothing because there's like, you know, it's worth like, I suppose it, it wasn't like a fully functioning business, but I still went ahead with it anyway, just because I had this like really gut, like I had this gut instinct. I can't explain it at the time, but I just knew it was a good idea. And you said uh, you would do things differently <clears throat> next time mm -hmm. around. What would you differently? What would you do differently? Yeah, I learning? think. Yeah, I think now I'd probably be more educated around it. Perhaps like talking to a business broker, um, getting more, I guess, like outside outsiders to evaluate the business and then make a decision from there, like objectively, rather than a gut instinct or, and. Yeah. How much I'm willing to pay for it. So, so how did that transaction uh, actually happen? So, obviously, uh, the lady had a domain name, which was Midnight Mischief. Did she have any stock at the time? Yeah, she had stock, but she sold through everything. So, I practically was left with like a handful of pajamas. Okay. Um, so, when I first started, I have I had to buy like my first hundred pair of pajamas up front, or I had nothing to sell. Yeah. Um, so, practically, that transaction happened. She like gave all the passwords and everything um yeah she gave all the passwords for the accounts i guess just normally i don't know how it normally happens but um yeah she just transferred everything across so did you transfer the fifteen thousand first, and then hope that she was going to transfer you all the information yeah i because we were there on the night like we were there together like signing the contracts and i bank transferred it in front of her face <laughs> so um it was a very real life transaction because she was living in the same state so like i knew where she lives yeah and i also um in the contract i also put in that she would need to mentor me for six weeks because she did have a yeah. really good Smart. retail background and i had nothing so yeah she was really helpful and really supported me throughout that process yeah. and i know a lot of bad um transactions where like the biz like the previous business owner ghosts people but to this yeah. day like i still keep in touch with her if i need um, like any opinions on things. She's like still really supportive and she's like our number one fan. How, how did it make you feel when you press transfer on that $15,000? Because I have, we have uh, clients in our coaching business and, and one of them said when they had to put, make their first order, he, um, she couldn't, uh, one of them, I forget which one now, couldn't actually press the transfer button because they were just so scared and full of anxiety that the other partner had to just say, screw it, we're doing it, and, and press the button. How did you feel? Um, I think during that time, I have to think way back, but I think I was just really excited. Like it just needed to be done. Like I really wanted this business. Um, so there was no hesitation on that. And I think I was just like very driven at the time. Like I knew it was a good idea and like I really wanted to make it work. And I think a lot of it came from the fact that everybody said that I was going to be a failure and like it's not going to work. Like the commercial accountant said, you know, you're not you're not good enough. Like you don't know what you're doing. Like I don't think you should do it. Like my friends were like, you know, if you fail, we're going to say like I told you so, but we'll still support you. So I think it was more of like, uh, like I'll show you sort of vibe. Should, should send you last year's tax return to the same accountant. <laughs> <laughs> and so with, just with the um, the actual um, garments themselves, you've designed it. You said you had a, a design background or you're a, a self-taught design? Yeah, self-taught designer. So 
Um, no design background, but I did grow up, I guess, like loving fashion. And my parents actually, when they came to Australia, um, they had no trade or they had no skills. So they actually did, um, I guess Australia gave them the chance to learn how to sew, like in TAFE. So they did sew for like years and years. And so uh, on that, that was the next thread I was going to pull on, excuse the pun, um, is where do, they, where do you manufacture the garments? So they uh, China or do you manufacture them onshore? Yeah, we manufacture them in China. Yeah, got it. You've done a beautiful job, Tess, honestly. Like I'm not a, obviously <laughs> the target market, but they're just a really like I as a as a guy looking at them, I just think they're just a really classy, beautiful product. So I just wanted to congratulate you on doing a great job and for whatever that's worth it. But obviously the market has embraced and, and voted for your skills. So well done. Um so so tell us a little bit about um I mean, so many people. How old were you when you did that transaction? I think I was around 21 turning 22 yeah yeah so you're 21 22 year old um your parents were sewers though right so they you said that they came to australia from vietnam i'm assuming with you yeah yeah, yeah. So, refugees they, from vietnam. so they're refugees from vietnam so i'm sure they're extremely proud of you now how were they at the time when you decided to do this um because you moved from healthcare, you know to making pajamas but i guess given that they were in the garment trade to some extent they may have seen why but what, what was their view and how did you process that as a young woman oh um i think they didn't really care when i started the business because i still was working full-time as a physiotherapist okay. so they were just like very supportive of it um but then when i did the transition to going full-time in business that's when they're a bit hesitant i mean at the end of the day my parents were very they're, they're not like helicopter parents. They're just more like, be a good person. You can do whatever you want with your life. Like once you hit 18, do, do whatever you like. So they've never been, they're not your overbearing strict parents. Thank, thank, like, thank goodness. So I never felt as though I was like restricted in that way. But I think my dad didn't say anything, but my mom was like, oh my gosh, you wasted, you know, four years in physio um, just to go into business. Like you have such a good career and job already. Like, are you sure you want to do this? Um, and I think it's more because like, with my parents and most Asian like refugees, they want like security and safety for their children. They just want a stable and like uh, a stable job for them. So for example, my dad, for example, <laughs> because he's not well educated, he's like, wow, you know, like nursing's like, um, like they get paid so well. And I'm like, dad, not really. <laughs> um, so that's, that's what they think success is like a stable career um, that Practically any job that doesn't involve like factory work. And I think when they saw the business and like, you know, how much packing and manual labor there was, I think that kind of, um, they didn't want me to have that life. Yes. Yeah. Do you do any of the packing and manual labor now or not? Uh, no, no, not now, but definitely if there's, if it's needed, I will. How, how many are on your team now? Like, uh, in Sydney? Yeah. So we have a very lean team. Like I actually don't have anyone on my books. Um, like, I guess like not, no full-time people on my books, but we have a lot of like casual staff and I do work with a lot of freelancers and a lot of offshore staff. And I've made sure to do it that way. Just so it's because I know that I'm still quite new in business and I'm always just preparing for like the worst and the best case scenario in terms of like scaling up and down like an e-commerce brand. And because my business is very seasonal, like I don't need a lot of full-time staff during like the winter seasons, whereas Christmas time, that's when we need to really scale up and ramp up our business. Speaking to them, as you said, it was a one one lady or one person band when you bought it and you've got um, uh, a myriad of staff now, mix them onshore, offshore and, and whatnot. Um, you don't talk like someone uh, now who's uh, green in business. So what was the, uh, the did you uh, do any courses or uh, become part of any communities around e-com? Because you certainly... Um, a vast change in the five or six years yeah for sure um so i guess when i started in 2018 there wasn't a lot of information about e-commerce there was like founder a few podcasts here and there and so it was just more like figuring out along the way 2019 like there still wasn't a lot of information i think then 2020 there was like a big rise in like small business like on tiktok um so there was a little bit more information more podcasts and then when i went full-time in the business um at the end of 2020, early 2021, like I was so lost. Like I didn't know what next steps to take. And so I literally Googled like best business course, like in Australia and like the entourage came up. So I did a few months with them, um, but I felt like that didn't fix my problems. Um, and then I guess I just learned along the way from that experience. And then I did a, another course, e-commerce equation. 
um, with Jay Wright in 2022. Yeah, 2022. And that really helped me understand like Facebook ads, understand like products, understand like profitability in the business and just have more systems and processes in place. So I think that course really helped me with my business. Yeah, they do a good job over there. And, um, you know, that I think it's such an important part, isn't it, of learning, especially when you're coming up without the experience and having the humility to say, I need help. I'm going to go and invest in my learning. Um, it makes such a big difference. So Midnight Mischief, it's bought off Gumtree for $15,000. We see in the press, you've grown it to a multi-million dollar business working from home in Sydney, part-time around being a physiotherapist. That's a great story. Um, but let's let's dive in a little bit into how you actually uh, grow this business. So you've got you've got this you've got a hundred sets of pajamas, you've got somebody who's doing your embroidery and you're like, I need to scale this thing. So what were the most what were the first things that you tried that worked and what was the first thing that you tried that failed? Mm, okay. I think the first thing I tried was um I listened to a podcast for like through the high smile guys. And they said, like, use influencer marketing and gift out the items to as many people as possible. So I literally did that. Like, I reached out to, like, 100 girls, like, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of girls and hopefully um, was just, like, waiting for a reply. And then a few people replied. And, uh, like, I had no money. So I literally would, like, ship them in, like, le- like my pajamas and, like, letters just to, like, save as much money as possible. That's how, like, frugal I was. Um, and then, yeah, like, that was back in 2018, 2019. So um, that's when influencers would still post for free and would get some traction there because it was such a Instagrammable product like personalized pajamas like that's so cool like I've never seen that before whereas now the market has definitely changed and people are aware of that um, solution to their problem so it doesn't have that much of an impact anymore just like it did back in 2018 in 2019 so that's what I initially did and then I was recommended by the previous owner to do a lot of corporate orders <laughs> um, so I like got a bunch of like businesses like scrape them just like research them online and then I started like emailing every single person like with our corporate like order deck and no one replied so it was just like a big waste of time and people even said please unsubscribe me from this email um so that was like yeah lots and lots of rejections and I thought okay I definitely can't go that corporate way because I don't have a lot of social proof so we need to build direct to consumer instead Okay, so you did the influencer thing, though. I read in the press that you did have a breakthrough with the influencer mm-hmm. side. Like, obviously, High Smile are like the kings of cracking the influencer marketing world with uh, the Jenners and, you know, Conor McGregor and all those guys. So what was your first big breakthrough with the influencer marketing and how did that um, come about? Sure. So in 2019, I engaged with a PR agency. And once again, that was more like an opportunity that fell in my lap. I didn't know what PR even was. At uh, the PI agency reached out, be like, hey, I can like, you know, get your items onto your like, publications and I can help you grow your brand. And um, at the time, the retainer was just like so expensive. Well, to me, like I had no money. Like I was on a full-time income and I was like, how am I going to afford this? But I thought, okay, you know, I'm, I'm doing this business just to try new things. Like I went into the business like with the mindset of like, I want to learn and experience things because I can read that all on books, right? But having that real world experience is more important. So I just thought, okay, I'm just going to save up my like money and put all my income into that PR agency. And yeah, if you, um, like that was just really instrumental in our growth because before that, I didn't know who like the hottest influencers were in Australia. Like I never watched any reality TV shows. I wasn't up to date with celebrities. I didn't know any other brands really. So she really helped me like pinpoint who was popular at the time. And we got product placements on a lot of like hot influencers back then. And then um, during that time as well, like right place, right time, because I was doing that legwork and groundwork back in 2019, we had our big break in like 2020, right? Um, When COVID hit. So I still remember um, there was an editor that reached out to the PR agency saying that, hey, like I want to run a story around pajama brands and items that are selling, like, can I um, feature Midnight Mischief? And then they featured Midnight Mischief. And honestly, like we like tripled our revenue, like from one day to another. And then we just continued to grow because we had that social proof. So us being in that media publication was so helpful. And we had like celebrities ordering our pajamas because at that time, everybody was like reading the news every single day. 
So for us to be front, like on the front page, just gave us a lot of social proof and I guess awareness around the brand. And then from there, we just like doubled down on like that influencer marketing. Um, we really tapped into that whole like matching mummy and me um, style and like working from home. So because yeah, matching mummy and me, um, like the men would purchase it for the wife and like the kids or kids. So it was like a higher average order um, value, I guess, purchase. And so we really like honed into that marketing messages, mes- message at the time. Yeah, I can see how that would have worked. I, I, I saw an Instagram ad not long ago for a, some track suits that had wifey on the bum. And I, <laughs> I, and I call my wife wifey. And when I ordered them for her, she absolutely loved it. Like, and that sort of personalization, a little bit of humor. So I want to just dig, pull on that thread again, thinking about the young people listening to this or maybe older people who are just trying to start a brand like this. When you say it was a lot of money, how much was a PR agency retainer? And I read in the Daily Mail that you said, you know, I sacrificed social life. I didn't go out. I poured every single dollar into my business, which is such a powerful message, you know. Um, how, how much was the retainer and, and how do you actually work with a PR agency? Like, do you meet with her once a month or is it, um, how do you actually work with a PR agency? What it cost? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was a few thousand dollars. Um, I don't want to state like how much I was paying her at the time because she has changed her. Okay. Um, she has increased her prices, but nowadays, um, PR agencies are charging up to, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. You can even go up to like $10,000. Um, I would say if you're starting out, like try your best to find like a freelance PR, like it's much more affordable. So after I used the PR agency, I did want, like, I had a friend who worked in PR and so she just freelanced for me on the side, which I think was equally as good. So just with any like agency that you work with, if you know how their systems are run and like, you know, the process, like you can inbuilt that into your own team. Um, and which is what I've tried to do with the help of like freelancers on the side, um, which is like a lower cost option of paying, you know, the full retainer of a PR agency. Um, sorry, what was your question again? Is, it, is that just while we're on that, is it, is it things like using source bottle and stuff like that? When you refer to what PR agencies do, uh, what mm-hmm. systems or tools could somebody self do their own PR? Do you know any of doing, yeah. you, you know, like what would you do if you wanted to manage your own PR? Yeah, for example, there's a platform called Social Diary. Um, her PR agencies gatekeep a lot of that because yeah it's like their bread and butter so essentially you can go and that's um like my PR my friend who was a PR like she was the one that taught me that whereas like my PR agency um like they won't give that give you that information because it's their bread and butter right so um and it's their tools so um yeah like a small business can sign up to that platform it costs about like a hundred to two hundred dollars a month and then what you can do is like do call outs, for example. Let's say you have a new um, bottle that you're releasing. You can be like, hey, guys, like releasing this like blue bottle. I'm looking to gift these to 50 influencers. Reach out if you, you know, um, have influencers that are interested. And then you'll literally just get people like brands or influencer uh, managers reaching out to you. So it's just like a really like cool platform to use rather than like emailing every single person or every single talent agency. It's just more of like a, so like it's a, space. A, it's, a market pl- it's a marketplace for uh, influencers to find products to promote on their channel or get free products from brands. Is that kind of uh, Yeah. So I guess it's more for PR agencies. So uh, they'll list things like events, for example. So you'll have a diary of, let's say July, you'll see all the events. So it was created. So um, let's say you wanted to run an event like next Saturday, but let's say Cardio is also running an event, you know, not to do an event on the same day. Got it. Oh, that's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. I know I want another one that they use or that I was subscribed to for a while was called Source Bottle, S-O-U-R-C-E, not, but it's called Source. So Source okay. Bottle, actually, when you subscribe, uh, journalists and, and, uh, media put out requests for I'm looking for an expert on this or I'm looking for an expert on that or I'm looking for a brand around this and you get daily emails of uh, the ability to contribute and and be connected in stories that's also another good good tool for people so so you have a few thousand dollars you retain this expert how did you actually work with her was it that you know you sat down once a month and and she would report back to you how does a PR relationship work I think that's interesting for people because we we always see these brands and on their sites it says as seen in you know you know, men's fitness or in L magazine or whatever. 
How does that actual relationship work? Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially, it just depends on like your retainer, I suppose. Like the more you pay, the more support you'll get. Um, but yeah, definitely once a month or, or maybe multiple times a month, like maybe once a fortnight, you would sit down and plan three months in advance just because, yeah, with media, everything works, you know, three, six months in advance. So you do need to know what key marketing messages you have and like what product releases um, you're going to release in the next few months. And then practically your PR agency will write a plan around that. Like, okay, we're going to target these publications and we're going to seed and gift the, like your product to these people. I think, you know, let's use these, like if you have um, budget to pay influencers, these three influencers are hot at the moment. And I think they're really aligned with your brand. So they'll practically, because they're working with a lot of clients, I think that's the that's the selling point for a lot of PR agencies because they're working with a lot of brands. They can see what's actually working for everybody. Just like with the Facebook ads agency, they know which products are working. They know, they know which ads are working. Um, whereas if you're just like working in a silo yourself, like you have to go find those answers or like talk to other business owners. So there is definitely value in PR agencies. Um, so yeah, during that time I did leverage my PR agency and I was because I was very hesitant on like spending thousands of dollars on influencers, I would be like, like how much money did they actually generate in another brand? And she wouldn't be able to say, but she would just say, you know, yes, they work. Like they're selling through product. And so that gave me the confidence to like choose those influencers as well. So essentially, yeah, the PI agency will help you create a plan and then you can say yes or no to it. Just on those influencers to unpack that even further, um, what was your actual strategy, if you wouldn't mind breaking it down, like you're just sending a, a set of pyjamas out to a celebrity with the, the um, initials embroidered on it, what was the actual um, required action from them? They had to create how many pieces of content, they had to tag you, like just walk us through what that looks like as well for the audience. Yeah, sure. So we went through like an unpaid and paid strategy. So we did a lot of gifting and like seeding as they call it. Um, through PR so we just like gifted publications and if they loved it then they would write about it and same as yeah like bigger celebrities um or bigger influencers sometimes I would just gift them and like never hear anything but then a few months later they would post I think um yeah like a few months later they would post in the pajamas like they actually did love the products so we had a lot of placement that way where it was just more like a spray and let's hope they love the product. Um, so it was very organic when it, when they did post things. Um, and when they wear, for example, when a, like a celebrity or influencer wears the pajama set in their story, they won't tag us, but they'll get a lot of questions from their followers being like, you know, where's that from? Where's that from? And so they'll have to answer that question sooner or later because they're bombarded with questions. So you can, you can go down that route, but then of course you need to, have a, like a recognizable product that people actually want. And then- Hey guys, we recently ran a property day where we took people on the road in two buses and showed them 12 real estate deals. Four of them were commercial and the rest were land subdivision deals around the Gold Coast and Southern Brisbane. And this is the workbook. It's a 43 page workbook where we actually show you each and every deal, how much was paid for it, how the, how the development was done, how much money was made and so much more. And we've decided to give this away to anybody who's interested in this kind of thing. All you need to do is go to unemployable.com.au forward slash 2024, 2024. It'll give you an insight into what our coaching clients get when they join us in the program. It'll show you how millions of dollars were created through real estate deals right here in Australia just in the last few years. And you can get it for absolutely free. Go to unemployable.com.au forward slash 2024. And number two is like the paid influencer strategy. So yeah, with influencers, I guess like they can set whatever rate they want, but then you have a lot of room to negotiate at the same time. Um, so yeah, you just negotiate like what you want out of it. So you can say, you know, like you just want to have them to post three stories about the product or you want to have a story and a post and then they'll practically give you rates and I guess like packages that you can pay for. Can you um, give us an example of where that's worked really well and where that's worked really badly, like with metrics? So I paid X amount and like, what did you learn? I'm not saying name the influencers, but either. Yeah. So like what type of influencer did you have a great result with? What were the metrics of their audience and how much did you pay and what did you get back? And then over in this case study, this was their audience. This is what I paid and this is what I got back. Like good and bad of both. Mm -hmm. And like, that would be really interesting. Yeah, sure. I think 
for example, with our latest data, like when we've paid people who have a lot of followers, but don't have a very like engaged audience where they love them. So maybe like a TikToker um, might not be as good because TikTokers generally, like if they're a younger person as well, I guess it's like hard to say because you have to look at your product first, right? So my product is not for like your Gen Z audience because it's a bit more higher priced. Um, and unaffordable so yeah we've used like a gen z like mummy influencer before who was like a huge tiktoker like millions and millions of followers but we didn't generate as many sales so i think it was more the fact that you know they didn't have that purchasing power despite the fact having an audience so that was more around brand awareness whereas the influencers that have worked in the past i find that like right now like if i were to work with the influencer i would work with those who have a youtube audience because those are the those are the influencers that have diehard fans. Like they're dedicating like 30 minutes to watch your life, mm. right? And they're really invested in you. Whereas if you just have short form content like on your Instagram, like people don't really learn and know who you are. But if you're a YouTuber, like people are investing like hours and hours into your life and they really love you. So um, big influencers are YouTubers, like generally that's the way to go. And they know how to sell product. They know like filmmaking. They know how to tell a story. Um, they know what their audience loves. So I that's that's it. that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd like to even pull on that thread a little bit more because this is the kind of granular that is very hard to find out there in the business education world. Like <laughs> people say, "Oh yeah, do influencer marketing," but like I've got questions like, you know, everything from how do you actually get the address of a celebrity? <laughs> like you say, "Oh, we just bail this stuff out to a celebrity or somebody with millions of followers." Or how, what do you write in the DM? How many of those DMs do you write before you get somebody saying, sure, here's my address or my agent's address? Um, but I also want to talk about like somebody who's got millions and millions of followers. Like one of the tenants in my buildings in Burley, their family, it started off with the girl and then the, the husband and now the two kids and their dogs. They've got 15 million followers between them and they sell a metric shit ton of stuff out of the warehouse we lease them. But I have no idea if I was to pay them or to get them to endorse something else. So I'd love to sort of deal, just hang on this for a minute. Like when you say somebody who's got millions and millions of TikTokers, how much would they charge for what? And then when you say YouTuber, like we know without running this pod, our average pod is an hour and a half. We've, we've only been guys six months and our audience has watched well over 100,000 hours of us, which is a lot different to somebody who's watched 100,000 10 second clips or whatever, you know what I mean? So. So can you give us like a, let's say, let's start with a case study where you engaged with a YouTuber. How big was their audience? What did they do for you? How much did you pay them? And what was the estimated return for you in terms of sales? Oh, yeah. So yeah, keep in mind, this was like back in like 2021, 2020, uh, 2021, 2020. So yeah, yeah. And we had like a lot of product market fit and everybody was purchasing because they had a lot of money. Um, but I definitely still saw like, yeah, immediate value. So we did use a YouTuber. And she did have like more of that fashion niche, beauty niche. She created like beauty lifestyle videos and she was creating content for like 10 years already. Um, so her audience like like hung off every like word she said. Like whatever she says, they will do. Like jump off a cliff, they will do it. An Aussie, so, Aussie girl? Yeah, Aussie girl. Um, and so, yeah, as soon as she posts, like we just get like impulse purchases, like people purchasing straight away because they want the exact same item that they are wearing. Um, we've had other influences with that similar effect where, um, yeah, if they're seen wearing the pajamas, like the, the customer will come to us and be like, Hey, what, what size is this influencer wearing? I want that exact same item. So there's definitely a real effect. Whereas I've, I've also done influencer campaigns with more like celebrity types, but because celebrities are more on TV and are more aspirational, they don't have that. Let's stick with like the first the first one for a minute. So how much how big was her audience? Like how many subscribers and what does it cost? Like I've got absolutely no range on this at all. <laughs> like is it like a million people and it costs you ten grand or is it one grand? You know, like where where's the sort of ballpark uh, okay. this kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. So um so keep in mind that I've chosen a YouTuber, but we mainly predominantly did all our um campaigns on Instagram mm -hmm. because we don't have a YouTube like we don't have a YouTube presence. So it's much better to, um, I guess, link everybody. I guess showcase like your portfolio. Wherever you are most present on yes. a platform, like use that one. 
So yeah, the rates have changed definitely a lot since like 2020. So you would pay people like a few thousand, um, like less than like zero to five thousand dollars. Um, now, for example, to get a TikToker who has like one to three million followers, they're charging up to like ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a post. And for that, they do a TikTok of you, yeah, you know, using your product. Is that right? Mm, and yeah, or it. it's yeah, open to negotiation. But yeah, the price nowadays like very, very like it's much more expensive, and it doesn't work as well. Like, so you have to be very selective now. You have to find the right one, right? Because I remember, exactly. I think I was, I can't remember whether I was a podcast. I was talking to somebody, and they paid Kylie Jenner or something a million dollars for one post. It might have been High Smile, and yeah. somebody yeah. said. Oh my God, like a million dollars. And the guy said, and I would pay it every single time in a heartbeat, given what I, we got back from it. Mm. So I guess it's trial and error. But when you start dealing with those bigger TikTokers, it's pretty hard to trial and error when it's 10 grand to go sort of thing. So, you know, for a small brand starting out today, like let's say you were starting now, what would you do in terms of paid social today, knowing what you now know? Paid social. I would... I wouldn't invest in paid from the get-go. I would really invest and make sure that my product is something that people want naturally. And then influencers is there for to amplify like a good product because there's, you know, if the, you're selling something that no one wants and you put on influencer, no one's going to purchase anyway. So focus on your product first. Make sure that it's something that people genuinely want, like you would purchase, like your friends will purchase first. You get that social proof. And just like with Facebook ads, like there's no point pushing a pro- like a dead product like no that no one wants you're just going to burn through cash like um so focusing on product first and then once you have that i think gift do gifting see if there's traction there and then okay if you kind of fulfill that like influencers like that um item and are happy to post it organically then go into paid is there any hacks or tricks there on the gifting side as in terms of what to say or how to do it or are you just sitting there literally with your phone and saying Hi, it's Tess from, you know, uh, Midnight Mischief. I've got these cool pajamas. I'd love to send them to you for free. Where should I send them? Is that what you do or is there another way of doing that? Uh, no, yeah, just keep it really simple, uh, really uh, short, simple, sweet. And um, are we do it more around key events to make it a bit more special. So, for example, Mother's Day, like, okay, we created this Mother's Day package for you. Would really love to send it. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, like, I would love that. So making it a bit more special and around key moments makes you stand out rather than a, um, I'm just like sending this just to send it. But if you make them, if you, I guess like curate it and make them feel very, very special, like, and make it very intentional, they're going to feel that. So that's my recommendation. So tailor it to them at a special time. And then you mm-hmm. just have, so you're doing it, I guess. You just sit there, just punching these offers out and then they come back, you send them in the post and, you know, and that's it. It's yeah, a, and hope for the best. <laughs> I love it. Just pull on that um, the paid. You, you say first product market fit. Make sure you get a hungry hungry market uh, and get that right. Yeah, then you got influencer content there. So then you start to repurpose that user generated content in your paid strategy, bro. Mm-hmm. Um, so right. with the, but to run a paid strategy, you obviously need um, the fat in the in the in the price point. What is the average order value um, for mid uh, mid mission? Yeah, our average order value is about one hundred and ten dollars. So. And, One and a bit dollars. And then, so do you have uh, like many repeat buys? What's the return rate like? Yeah, so we are sitting on like a twenty percent return rate. So yeah, our customer audience is very unique in that we have a lot. So like we have a bridal audience, so they'll just be like a one-off purchase, but then they'll come back later and they'll purchase like a gift for their mum or, um, like yeah, for their friend. And then we have like a male audience as well like they'll only come and purchase like on valentine's day or mother's day um and then we have a christmas kind of like cohort where they only like buy christmas pajamas like i kid you not they only come back to buy christmas pajamas so we have um very unique audiences but we do target more of like we go down more of the gifting angle because that's more evergreen whereas you know when someone is like like if you're struggling for cash, like you're not going to spend money on yourself, but you're always going to spend money on gifts for people or special events or, you know, your wife or your anniversary. So we really um, hone in in that gifting message. And just back to that influencer marketing and, and some of those people, celebs you've got, I'm assuming you're targeting uh, Aussie-based celebs uh, because you're probably Aussie, but you're with those um, celebrities, they're going to have an audience that is offshore, i.e. US or wherever. Do you get m- many um, international orders coming through? Yeah, so we do get international orders organically, 
but it's not our big focus. Like mm. right now, because we are such a like small lean team and I'm only really new in business, like I want to make sure like I have the systems and like even myself set up like a routine and making sure my mindset is right before I scale like too quickly. I just love your humility. Um, you know, it tests it. You're just so, uh, you know, you're crushing it. You're doing a, uh, you're doing a really good trade and you're just still so curious and humble. And I, and I think everyone listening or watching this right now can learn a lot from that. Um, you know, you still see yourself at the early stages of your business career. And that is what is going to make you grow because so many people, they just stop learning. And that's why I like hanging out with young people. You you know, you, you don't have that. Like they say, that's the, uh, the ripe apple that falls off the tree and rots. It's the one that's still growing. So it's, it's wonderful. I can't wait to be going with it. Yeah, Eric, you got some so, questions. <clears throat> Back in obviously 2018, 19, when you bought the business, how did you come up with your pricing? So obviously it's a fairly new product. Like you said, there, are, there isn't many people doing this. How did you actually price a product from a, obviously a profitability standpoint, but also you said you're, it's, you're in a higher end market. So how do you not price yourself out of the market? Mm, yeah, I think that. Like I had no idea about that, but luckily <laughs> the previous owner did all the pricing and she did have a retail career. So she knew like wholesale pricing. She knew what to price it as. And she told me like $100 is that sweet spot where, you know, that's that's what people would spend on a gift. And if you price it to, to like more than that, it'll be too expensive. So she practically said like at, at a psychological standpoint, like $100 is a nice sweet spot for like the pajama sets. But then it also worked out financially in terms of like, uh, the cost, for example, and like your margins. So yeah. she taught me that from the very beginning. And has, um, with inflation and everything that's gone on, has it put a lot of pressure on pricing? Have you had to make many adjustments or? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot more competition now, to be honest. Um, like when I started, there wasn't a lot of personalized pajama brands. 2020, so many copycats popped up like with our designs. So we knew that we we're doing a good thing. Um, so how we mitigated that is like, I'm focusing more on like higher end products and more for like the bridal market. So for example, now we're selling like $250 pajamas for like the bridal customer. And like those pajamas you can't get, you know, on Sheen, on Temu, um, but they're still really wanted by like our bridal, like our bridal audience. So people are still spending like, you know, $1,000 per order because they can't get that anywhere else. So I'm focusing more on like product innovation, making sure we're creating products that aren't on a market. Okay. Thank you. And so what are the exact, logistics in behind a sale so because obviously there's a bit of double handling here with the embroidery so yeah yeah bring us through kind of you know that that journey of someone purchases you get the the ticket what happens from there exactly yeah. like is it in a warehouse is it a 3pl do you then physically have to go there and ship it to the embroidery lady to embroider how, how does it all work yeah, it's very manual to be honest. And I wouldn't recommend this kind of setup to anyone for like their first business, like fashion plus personalization. Yeah, it's like a huge headache to be honest. Um, <laughs> it's definitely not um, easy. But at the same time, I think that's why I've been able to last this long because a lot of people start and they're like, oh shit, this is really hard because um, it is hard. Um, yeah, and definitely the process I think could be much better. When I first started, I honestly like used to hand write every single order, send it into the embroiderers get it back and then I would, yeah, manually like fulfill every single order. So even up until like 2020, I was literally like typing out every single order because I just didn't have that mind, like that brain to be like, you can systemize and you can automate things. Like it was only until my partner came in and was like, you're doing this the hard way. Like, why are you working so hard? I'm like, I don't know how to make it easier. And he was like, you can just use like this. And I was like, okay. Um, so he helped simplify the business because he just saw how much hard I was working and like kind of working on the wrong things. And so now the system is, and once again, it could probably be much better, but um, when we get the order, it goes into a Zap, um, like yeah, Zapier. And then we go into Excel. We kind of sort it out um, between like non-personalized and personalized pajamas. And then we kind of like well, I'm a bit of a perfectionist and make sure, like I like to make sure like the customer has chosen the right thing. Because sometimes customers, if they, let's say they order five pajamas, sometimes they'll choose the wrong font for, wrong font, for example, for one of the pajamas. So we always message them and say like, oh, hey, are you sure? Like you want, you like, did you miss, like, did you, uh, I guess, 
click the wrong font, then they'll be like, oh yeah, thanks for picking that up. So it's very manual in that sense. And I have a VA kind of like sorting through the orders. Um, I'm sure there's a system that can do that much better. And then we practically get a sheet, we print it out, we collect it, and then we send it off to the embroiderers and then we get it back and we fulfill it. So if I were to order something today on Wednesday, when would I receive the actual order with obviously the double handling? Yes. So it depends. Like we have a free tiered system. We have like a VIP service, a express service, and then a standard service. So if you want it quicker, like you can get it within like three days. Just or if you really want it on the same day, like you can contact us. It will be like, we can turn it around today if you want. Okay. And I have one last question. Obviously, the peak of COVID 2020, your, your business probably would have boomed because <laughs> you're on the news, right? You're in, you know, uh, magazines and whatnot. And now all of a sudden, you know, the retail trade has, has come down quite significantly um, mm -hmm. over that time. How has that affected your business and how have you pivoted? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so we definitely did see a boom in like 2020. We still were growing 2021 uh, and then still growing 2022. And then I think the retail climate went a bit rocky in like 2023, 2024, because I've seen a lot of businesses close down recently, especially in the pajama land. Um, so what was the question? Um, yeah, we definitely seen an effect on ourselves. Like we haven't been able to push as hard on our marketing angles because we can just see that like, even if I'm trying to push like this angle of like, um, you know, like matching mommy and me, like that's not what consumers want at the moment. So what I've done is like, I've just seen what's worked, which is like new products and bridal audience. So we're really honing in our bridal audience because they're the ones who are like unlimited budgets. They are going to want the best of the best for their weddings. So we're really just... Instead of fo feature, uh, like focusing on like the mummy side, yeah. we're focusing more on bridal. And how did you come up with that though? Like that, that pivot? Because obviously you were doing that mummy and me and gifting and the rest of that. And then you just thought, well, obviously bridal is highly emotional. One day, you know, they're there to spend heaps of money because I've had a bridezilla in the past too. Um, <laughs> so yeah, explain that. Like where, where did that idea come from? Is it something just from research or you just notice people... Yeah. So initially, um, yeah, Midnight Mission started off as like a woman's wear slash bridal. Like we designed um, like sleepwear for your bridal party. So that was the main thing. But it was only until 2020 when COVID happened and I wasn't ever going to pivot into like kids wear or men's wear. But it was the fact that customers were wanting it. They're like, oh, do you have kids? Do you have men's? And that's when I started creating products. So I wasn't me creating the, the demand. Like the customers were asking for the products. And so, for example, they'll be like, oh, do you have a leopard print pajama? And I would have never released them. But because the, there was demand for it, I released it. And that's what people liked. Yeah, see, and that's not to be overlooked, right? Like that's so, so important is getting that data. Because in 2018, 2019, you don't have a clue of what people want mm. other than this lady telling you, I've been in retail, you just gave her $15,000 and she's telling you what she thinks. And yeah. it's so important to actually listen to what the client wants rather than you assuming what they want. And mm -hmm. and yeah, that pivot was, that's amazing. We did that with uh, Goldie Caravans, which is a portfolio company that we invested in to get them going. And uh, they uh, took their product, which was an 18 foot caravan, 16 foot caravan to the trade, to the trade shows and the industry shows and the public come out and look at all the latest caravan stuff. And they had a camera they, they put on the, on the way into the caravan, the side say, Hey, we're recording inside just so you know. And they were recording for people's reactions, which they made into reels, but also they were getting real feedback because most people just forgot the camera was there. And that, and we, there was things like. I love this caravan, but I want the bed facing the other way so that you don't have to climb over your partner to get in and out of bed. Like, and they wanted an island bed. And a lot of families would go, we want bunk beds for the kids. And it was just something they heard over and over and over. And then they released their beat, the, the, the next one, which was the 18 or 19 footer. And now it's their biggest seller. And it came from having cameras fitted, you know, um, in the vans and, and telling people, but it was priceless, the feedback that they got. But a lot of people overlook look the feedback and they don't listen. Totally, you know, 100%. like the, the, their ego comes into play and in thinking that they know better. And Adam just pulled something up here. I was going to mention it, and I think he's going to beat me to it. So no, uh, well, we're, I was just saying. Um, <laughs> As you, she said, you're a Shopify board. seller on Shopify. Yes. Shopify. Yeah, yeah, we had a we had a guy on the pod a few days ago. It's not out yet, but he uh, built an app called OrderEditing.com. Have you heard of that? 
Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah, you should have a look at it because it's um, it, with your people wanting to change their orders, it's it basically enable. Have a look at it, orderediting.com. It'd be really good for you, I think, for reducing support tickets <laughs> and, and also increasing sales. It's yeah. very cool. Um, the automation, right? Like, obviously, it's very manual at the moment, but these apps for the amount that they cost, especially for the size of your business, to, uh, it's a no brainer. Like I asked the guy, I'm like, so why wouldn't anyone buy this? Like they'd have to buy this, you know? We, we should get him sponsoring the public, but to give you an idea, he's, he's from Melbourne and his first client was Mr. Beast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a pretty good endorsement of his technology and it's only for Shopify sellers and it solves a lot of the problems you just articulated for you. So have a look at it off, offline. Um, mm -hmm. So, so my, my final question, because we're almost out of time here, is what what's driving your business today from a from a growth point of view? Like, what do you do daily to grow the business now that you're at multi million dollar status? What are you doing to grow the brand? Yeah, I think right now I'm very big on like product, new product, especially in fashion. Like, you need to have something new to talk about um, every single month. Or yeah, it's just. It can't get stale. Um, so focusing on new products um, for like the bridal market, for example, and like new marketing messages. Right now we have a Christmas in July campaign and I've done that just because I've seen like what other pajama brands are doing. Like no one does it. And <clears throat> that's just me being like very competitive where it's like I, I'll give you a good discount. Um, buy my pajamas now. But like my idea is if people buy my pajamas now, they're not going to go and buy like Cotton On or like Peter Alexander later, right? They're going to choose Midnight Mischief. So we get our foot in the door and then if they love our product, they'll purchase it again next year, um, like in every single Christmas. So yeah, products, um, marketing messages. And I, yeah, all, I'm always looking at like what people are purchasing now, trying to get like feedback, always asking for feedback um, for new product innovations. And I focus mainly on content and Facebook ads. Right. And so you're, you're marketing a lot through EDMs to your list, I imagine, at this stage. Um, mm -hmm. And this is one of the most powerful things about what you've done. Like a lot of our audience sell on marketplaces like Amazon, where and the big advantage you have is you have the customers. So they're your customers, your database. How much of your business would you say comes from your database versus comes from new direct marketing? Oh, um, Just a guess. I would say probably about like, oh like email marketing itself, I'd say about like 30%. Yeah, just from, mar I just mean any marketing to your existing customers. Oh, to your existing. Yeah, like yeah. email marketing is probably the way you reach out. But but yeah, yeah that's my point, right? So you're a multi-million dollar business and 30% at least is coming from email, right? So that's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or more coming from email marketing. And this is why I always say to people, follow what Tess is doing here. She's built a brand that come to like and trust and know her. And then you focus on innovating with new beautiful products from you observing the world of fashion and your own creative flair. And and that's the asset is really the relationship that you have with the clients, you know? Um, so is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, no, yeah, I definitely believe in, yeah, like retaining your current audience and making sure they're happy because it's much easier to sell to you, like you already noticed, but yeah, sell to your existing customers. So like innovating and keep keeping something fresh for them. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you're in a business to serve people. So people are always going to want something new, fresh, um, that kind of elevate their lifestyle. And that's how, what I keep in mind. So for example, our bridal audience, like I, like I'm in a stage now where I'm like looking at wedding stuff. So like, what would I actually wear? What would I um, pay my money, um, like spend my money? So I'm always thinking about like, how can I create the best product for like the best value for our customers? Are you still full-time in physio? No, I'm, I'm full-time in business now. So I went full-time in like end of 2020, um, early 2021. Now, obviously you're <clears throat> full-time in physio and, and running this business. So how, how did you manage that? How many hours were you working in physio? And then when were you working on your business? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just like working 24 seven, to be honest, because yeah, once I paid that $15,000, I had like $0. So I had to like start from scratch. Um, I actually had to like borrow like money off my sister, borrowed money off my boyfriend and I hate borrowing money. Like I never borrow money. So I like, I tried to like work extra shifts. I worked on the weekends. I did like sports physiotherapy jobs. I did like first aid course, like first aid jobs on like the weekend. So I was always working. Um, so that was like really good with my physio career in that it was flexible and we had a lot of hours. I even worked like 
um, my clinic had like extra reception shifts. So I would like literally after my um, physio shift was done, I would work up until like eight o'clock doing the reception shifts. And because like my workplace was like an hour away, like I like I hustled so hard. Like <laughs> I took the Gary Vee thing too seriously. And I was like, I'm going to sleep in my car and like rock up to work at 6 a.m. the next day. So I was like real grinding back then um, because I was just like in survival, man. Like I needed to make this work. Like I couldn't like, like how embarrassing like I went into this business and then people like I told you so like I knew you would fail so I was like very like I think as an early 20 year old you're just like I want to make it so you're like doing everything like hustling like doing whatever Gary Vee says and and whatever you hear in a successful podcast like you need to work hard like I I really like bought into that do you think uh, I'm just curious like you're a first generation Australian and I think you probably have a very sharp appreciation of what that means to, you know, like how hard your parents did it to get here. You know, they came in as immigrants with nothing. And do you feel a debt of gratitude to them for that? And how, what's your lens like when you think about life in Australia? Because I recently posted a video where Tucker Carlson came to Australia recently and he was saying, yeah, you know, calling out some of our problems as a country, which I agreed with. But I was surprised at the amount of self-hatred that came from Australians. Australians screwed. It's gone to the dogs years ago. It's a shit country. And I was like, wow, I didn't expect that much hate from Australians of our own country. And then I look at you and I hear the story of your parents coming from Vietnam. And I love Vietnamese people. I love Southeast Asian. I spend a lot of time up there. Um, What's your view as a first immigrant Australian of this country and the opportunities here? Yeah, for sure. Um, So I think it comes back to a story when I was like 11. I guess like I grew up in a very like, you know, Australian lifestyle. Like I wasn't, uh, I guess like my parents protected me from the fact that, you know, there are some like hardships in the world. But I think when I was like 10, 11, they took me back to Vietnam to their village. And that was the first time I, like I went to Vietnam when I was a baby, but I never remembered. But then I went there and I lived there for a month, like on holiday with my parents. So I became like very Vietnamese, but like my parents grew up in a really poor village. Like, you know, my parents, my mom was like picking weeds off like cemeteries to like have for dinner. Like that's how poor they were. Um, uh, like they grew up during the war. And yeah, I think during that time, like I met a lot of my cousins who were the same age and I was playing with them and they were like, you know, running barefoot around everywhere. Like they just didn't have like the opportunities that um, like we had in Australia. Like uh, I guess when you think of it, think of like having a princess being put in like a third world country and like, oh my gosh, like I'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't like touch that. Like, why am I sharing outside? You know, like your typical, like very privileged, like Australian, um, not like Australian girl. Like I'm not saying like Australian girl, but essentially when you go, when you're like living in a first world country and then you have to like downgrade your lifestyle, you're practically like a princess. Um, so I think that comparison and I really could see the comparison of like, okay, this is what my life could have been like if my parents stayed in Vietnam. Like I would have been like running barefoot, like um, on the streets of Vietnam, like on roofs, like uh, my cousins did, like no manner, like really poor mannerisms, like no, re- like, like no educate, like, you know, poorly educated. And I, during that time as well, um, like in that village, like in that span of a month, like maybe like five people died. And I was like, what's happening? Like, I didn't even know what death was, right? Like, I did know about it, but, like, I never experienced it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, people are dying so young. Like, they're 40, 50 years old. Like, they're dying just because they don't have access to healthcare. And I think just from all those experiences, like, my parents bring, bringing me back to Vietnam, I was just, like, I was very grateful for the life I had in Australia. And I was like, I just made a promise to myself, being like, I'm, I'm going to make the most of my life here. And is there a part of you that wants to improve their life? Uh, my uh, Back in Vietnam. Life. Oh, well, just your family's life as well. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, I think it's just more like the better I become, like the the better like ripple effects it has on everybody. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I can just in- inspire like my family back at home um, and just like inspire the community around me. Because so, I look at a yeah. young person like you and you're in your 20s and you're doing millions of dollars in sales and having walked that path for 30 years as an entrepreneur, I can tell you, Tess, that a lot of good's going to come from you. Um, you're only just starting and and the beautiful thing about capitalism and entrepreneurship when it's done with a responsible and kind heart is quite profound. Uh, so don't underestimate the impact that you can have over the long term on not just the people close to you, but the, those 
overseas, the work that you can do through charities, uh, the inspiration that being on pods like this and being in front of audiences everywhere, please say yes more often because no, I'm serious. You know, like we, we need voices like you. I mean, when you said that your, your mother picked weeds off cemeteries, I really felt that. That's amazing. We're looking at one young woman that is one generation from somebody who made a living picking weeds off cemeteries to feed her kid. And here you are building a, a multi-million dollar business in this country. I'm so, so uh, moved by that story. And I, and I hope that you keep saying yes and that you keep leading because uh, we need more Australians like you shining a light on the possibilities of this great country and not focusing on the negativity bias that is creeping into our culture. So thank you for being you. Oh, thank you so much for having me on and letting me share my stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tess, it's been an absolute joy. Uh, guys, thanks for uh, uh, being here with us good. today. Yeah, Tess, thank you for, uh, thank you for, for, for being here and uh, we look forward to hearing more about your journey and uh, seeing you in the Young Rich list or something one day, I'm sure. <laughs> so good for you. Uh, and good luck with your wedding, I believe. You said you were uh, looking at weddings and if you are getting married, congratulations on that as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye-bye. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.